Okay, um, so today it's our pleasure to have uh, uh, Dr. Jin Ho Young from Academia Sinica. So he is an uh, assistant research fellow at the Kinsa School of uh, Statistical Science. Today he's going to tell us about extra type theorems for block token system. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the hospitality and it is my such a great pleasure to be in here and actually it is my second time to be in NTHU but the first time I was in the upstairs at statistics department so basically getting invited in the math department is the first time and then yeah so far I really enjoy the class and then the buildings over there and then today I am uh, my presentation consists of two parts the first part is I'm going to introduce and formulate what is the Baxter type convergence theorem and also for block topology system also I'm going to explain some of the existing researchers and then I'm going to generalize this to the something called the uh, system with the uh, totally system with long memory and then I'm going to explain what is the long memory in what sense and then also I'm going to give a very short uh, sketch of the proof which is very important contribution of my paper preprint and then the second part of my talk is about the application of our theorem because I am a statistician, so I have to think about so where this theorem can be used and then how can you use and then why this is important. So I'm going to spend a sufficient amount of time to introduce the statistical application of our theorem. And then before I begin, this is the joint work with Professor Aki Koinoe at Hiroshima University. And then, yeah, let's move on. So, why I was making my presentation, it is all about something called the Baxter type inequality or Baxter type convergence. And then, when I'm making my presentation, I realized that, oh, the name Baxter appears on the ninth slide, which I only prepared 25 slides, so the name Baxter appear almost like a whole, about like more than uh, one third of the talk later. And the reason why I introduce the why I not introduce the main theorem at the first is because I want to introduce the motivation and how as a statistician get interested in this kind of problem and how in my field I am basically uh, working on the time series and how in time series people get interested, get interested in this kind of problem. So a motivation of this talk is based on the prediction theory in second order stationary time series. So I'm going to spend maybe three, four slides about uh, basic terminology in time series and predictions and also some very important quantities in time series people that are, who are interested in to study. So let's begin on the very simple thing. So we have a C complex valued we have like a q val cq valued discrete time stochastic process xt and t indexed by uh, integer value and then we call this stochastic process a second order stationary time series or second order stationary stochastic process or in another word weekly stationary time series if we satisfy these two conditions the first condition it is kind of easy because their expectation, their mean is the constant so it does not depend on the time t and then since it is a constant uh, 
In this talk, we can just simply assume the constant is equal to zero vector, and that is good. And the second property is something more important, which characterizes the second order stationary time series, which which tells us that the covariance between two time series x t and x t minus r only depends on its difference on its leg. So covariance of maybe I can use okay covariance of x t and t minus r is a function of the leg r, uh, which is gamma r, and since it is a q variate time series, gamma r is a Q times Q matrix. And then we say this Q times Q, a sequence of Q times Q matrix as an auto covariance function of stochastic process XT. So, definition is easy, and I'm going to give a very simple example of the stochastic second order stationary time series, which is called the vector AR1 model. So suppose our stochastic process is defined based on this recursive equation, xt is equal to a times xt minus 1 plus a epsilon t, which is an IID error. And then there is some technical restriction on the matrix A, where the determinant is not equal to 0 when like inside and on the unicircle, then you can calculate the covariance between xt and xt minus r, and then you plug in xt is equal to a times t minus 1 plus epsilon t, then you can just expand, then it becomes a times covariance t minus 1 and t minus r, since epsilon t is a independent noise. Then you can do this over and over, and later what you can get is a to the power r times gamma zero. And this function only depends on the index r, which means xt satisfies these two <coughs> conditions. That means vector ar1 model defined in this recursion is actually a stationary time series. And also you can expand this to the vector ARP process where xt is determined by past p value in a linear fashion and then the noise on the, on the top of that you have a white noise. Then you can prove that it is a second order time series. So these two are the very typical example of the second order stationary time series in the literature. And then so we have, and then next slide, I'm going to define some kind of space that are derived by the second order stationary in time series. So suppose you have Q variate <coughs> second order stationary time series indexed by xt1 to xtq, and then what you can do is you can define a complex Hilbert space H in L2 uh, probability space, which is which is exactly the span by all entries of xt over <coughs> k from 1 to q and t index from the integer value. So it is span by uh, all entries. So it, since it is a Hilbert space, we need to have an inner product and then inner product is nothing but the usual inner product in L2 space. So it is quite simple, and then this is the well-defined Hilbert space. So we have a Hilbert space, so what we can do next is we can define a orthogonal projection. So orthogonal projection I index by pj, and j is a subset of integer, and pj is a orthogonal projection operator of h onto the subspace where the where hj is spanned by xj j index by large a so is it clear okay that is it's good and then the typical typical candidate of j is 
n m which is n m plus one all the way to m and minus infinity to n which mean uh, integer value least or equal to n and n to infinity integer value greater or equal to n and last definition in our in my talk is pjx suppose you have a q variable random variable x then the projection is defined as a entry wise projection so it's it is fairly straightforward definition so using this projection what we are going to do is we are going to do a prediction on time series that is suppose we consider we want to know the future value x n plus 1 and then the future value we need we want to what we want to predict and there are two type of predictors which is first one is prediction based on the random variable x1 through xn and the second one is prediction based on the entry xn xn minus 1 all the way up to infinite past so there are two types of prediction and then since it's a uh, orthogonal prediction what we can do is we can write down as a linear combination of x i's so that is pretty straightforward so the first projection I will call it as a best finite predictor and then it can be represented as a linear predict linear combination of x1 through xn the second is predict projection onto x the infinite path which i'm going to tell as a best infinite predictor and it can be also represented as the infinite sum of the linear combination and the interpretation is as follows as i explained the first Best final predictor is the one step ahead forecast based on the observed time series. And the coefficient AJN, it is known as the finite order your worker coefficient or best fitting ARN coefficient. And then the second one is the optimal, pre optimal forecast value because, why it is optimal? Because we assume that we know all the inf information on the path which is not realistic in practice but it could be a good start point when you are developing a theory so it is an optimal forecast based on the infinite path and the, the coefficient is called the infinite order Euro coefficient or best fitting AR infinity coefficient okay so there are two type of predictions one is finite, based finite. The second is in best infinite. And then I made a table of their good things and the bad things. In terms of the computation, so since the prediction is based on the finite past, the best finite predictor coefficient is computationally plausible to evaluate because it is it only involves a finite number of observation however the best infinite predictor coefficient aj is a infinite sequence so it means basically you are not able to calculate all the entries using computers so you somehow you need to truncate of course there is an algorithm to approximate this aj but this is on just an approximation this is not exactly a value so in terms of the computation the infinite predictor coefficient is not very attractive however the infinite predictor coefficient is attractive in the theoretical sense which means in asymptote the aj infinite predictor coefficient has a very well known asymptotic properties with like very sharp like a uh, asymptotic error and then these theories are developed by Zigo and Wiener and also 
Colmo Grove and other like a uh, very famous mathematicians. However, in, on the other hand, the best finite predictor coefficient do not have a very good asymptotic properties in theoretical, I mean, I mean like in theoretical perspective. So, what we can obtain, what we can get is best finite predictor coefficient. However, it is not theoretically attractive. On the other hand, the best infinite predictor coefficient you cannot calculate, but it has known theoretical, per theoretical properties. So our question is, what is the asymptotic properties of the finite predictor coefficient? Because you are able to calculate, and if you know the asymptotic properties, then you're done. You are very good to and you're very satisfied, you know what I mean? Then it's good. So my motivation comes from deriving the asymptotic properties of the finite predictor coefficient. And in a mathematical term, what is important is how can you bound and then what is the conversion rate of the L1 difference between finite and infinite <coughs> predictor coefficient. By the way, this norm is any norm because, you know, like uh, in, they are all norms are equivalent, but I choose the spectral norm. So what is the L1 bound of this? And what is the convergent rate? And then the Baxter's inequality gives the partial answer of this question. So that's what I uh, that's why I was interested in this problem, and then now we just like refresh, and then forget about what is the time series, what is the best coefficient. That is a little bit like tricky if you are the first time hearing this. However, for next few slides. I'm not going to explain anything about time series. I'm not going to explain anything about statistics, no, nothing about like random variable, only a very pure like equation, linear equation. So I'm going to define what is called, uh, it is not what I, why, what I define, but I'm going to explain the winner hoop system. By the way, speaking of the winner, he is the dead winner from the winner process and then last time maybe five times okay so i gave a talk on this and then i accidentally maybe it was my mistake i talk i say winer and then a lot of like a uh, german very gentle german professors they were very unsatisfied <laughs> And then, and then, just call me, and then, oh, you know, he is winner, not whiner. And then I say, oh, I'm so sorry about that. And then there are two things. So, I mean, like, the, the winner is the correct pronunciation, and then the professor, Nova winner, actually is a American, I guess. Yeah, he's American, so maybe some American pronounce it as a liner, I don't know, but, and then the second thing is, my name is Juno, and then many, like, European statisticians call me Juno, because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they think J sounds Y, so I learned that pronounce someone's name is very, very important, and you need to be very careful. So, I know the correct pronunciation is winner, so I'm going to use that. So, winner hope system is a same semi-infinite convolution equation, and that has a diverse application in engineering applied math and statistics. And this is the winner hope system. So, the left-hand side is a, it looks like a convolution equation, however, Okay, so it is a convolution equation. 
index by j is equal to 1 to infinity, but it is fine because you can let j z j equal to 0 in the like a negative index, it is fine. So the left hand side is the convolution equation and you have a output like k. And the most important part is k output the system only defined on the natural number. It only depends on k is equal to 1, 2, 3, or the way up to infinity. That means k is not defined on 0. k is not defined on the negative index. That means this is a convolution equation, but it is a half convolution equation. So if it is a full convolution equation, then you know how to solve this. You just like take a Fourier transformation, then it's done, everything's fine. However, since it is a semi-convolution equation, you need a little trick to solve this equation. <coughs> so here I explain the given a sequence yk, what we want to do is we want to solve this equation in terms of zj. And by the way, this gamma is q times q matrix valued even positive definite sequence. So we restrict our interest in the positive definite sequence. And then for those who are confused what is the positive definite sequence, I gave a definition of the positive definite sequence. So our goal is to solve this in terms of j and of course the solution is well known and then the form of the solutions are the explicit forms are already known already solved by the two mathematicians Wiener and Hoch. and then why I introduce Wiener Hoch system is because it is very related to the the best infinite predictor coefficient that I just explained that like five minutes ago. So we have xt second order stage in time series with auto covariance function gamma t and then we have a best infinite predictor with aj best infinite coefficient. Then how to solve aj? How to know aj? And as I mentioned AJ has a very good asymptotic property. It means you need to know the solution. You need to know how to solve for AJ. Is we construct the normal equations. That is, you have projection, and then you calculate the covariance with x m plus one minus k, and then projection. You can move this to other side because I think it is called adjoint operator <laughs> or you can move this and then when you move this is projection disappear. So that means this is basically gamma k. So it is good. And then on the other end what you can do is you can plug in this equation to the left hand side and then you can expand and then you can expand calculate the gain, then what you can ob obtain is gamma k is equal to sum aj times gamma k minus j, which is not exactly the same, but it is in the same spread, it is the same as the former Wiener of sy system. And then the important thing is this projection skill only apply for k a uh, positive value because the projection is from on to less than, less than or equal to n. So if k is a negative, this projection is not good. So what I want to say is if we let the output yk is equal to gamma k, then the Wiener uh, system is the solution of the winner of system after some conjugate transform is the infinite order one Euler coefficient. And then, of course, this is the infinite 
uh, system. So what we want to do is we want in practice, we, it is preferred to consider the finite section of the winner of system. That is, we truncate the sum 1 to n, and then we only define the system from k is equal to 1 to n. So we truncate the system. And why it is good to truncate the system? I just list like a three benefits. The first, this system can be solved in a finite time. That is a good thing. And the second is that this system guarantees that you have a solution because it is uh, an equation and variable, so you can solve this whenever the, the matrix is not singular. So you have, you definitely know you have a solution and you know that the solution is unique. And the second third thing is if you define this finite system, then it is free from like certain mathematical issues which are difficult to verify for the original winner of system. For example, you don't need to care about whether the solution is in L2. And also you don't need to care about the Fourier transform of the solution exists or converge. If it is converged, converge in what sense? So that is a good thing. And so these are the three advantages why you consider, you would like to consider the truncated system. And the example is if your output is exactly the same, the solution is the best fitting finite ARN coefficient. That is a good. And then you have a truncation, you have an approximation solution. That means you want to know how this approximation, how good is this approximation? And the boxers in quality provide everyone difference between the original solution and the, the final section approximation solution. And I'm going to very carefully explain what is the boxers in quality and their condition. So gamma k positive even positive definite sequence yk output and they are some kind of L1 sequence. So gamma k, their spectral norm, some of the spectral norms are bounded and yk is also in L1 and provided these two red condition, then you know the solution is L1 and then your L1 bound between the solution and the approximation is bounded by the tail, tail sum of the original solution times a constant where the constant does not depend on index n. So that is the first proof by Baxter in 1963 for univariate system and it was later like three decades later it was ex generalized to the multivariate system by Chong and Pramadi. And then the thing is this is the equation, this is the inequality and then what you are really interested in the right hand side and then the conversion rate is the same as the tail conversion rate of the solution then you know something strange because you want to know this bound but if you want to know this bound you can bound this with the original solution so it means you need to know what is the original solution of the winnerification so that is something that makes sense because you want to get the solution but you need to have <laughs> information of the solution. So that is not make sense for me. So you need the knowledge about the tail conversion rate is important. And then one more question about this condition is that the original proof from Baxter and Chang and Pramadi, their constant C, their bound C is can be represented in terms of the infinite L1 sum of the positive even definite sequence. That means it, you need to have this condition. This condition is essential to prove this equation. 
know what I mean? And then this, the first condition, gamma summability of the gamma k is, I am mean, going to say that it is a, the system has a short memory. So that means this inequality only holds when you have, when your memory is short. Then there are two questions. How about the system with long memory? That is, how do you have like a similar inequality or similar convergence for the system where the positive even definite sequence diverges? That is the first question. And also, the second one is, do we still achieve the convergence of the L1 difference at least your original solution diverges. That means you don't really care about this tail sequence. That is the good thing. And then our main theorem is as follows. So we proved a boxer type theorem under multivariate wrong memory with minimal assumption. So what is the minimum assumption? I'm going to explain. So gamma k is a positive even definite sequence and we are going to give a slight restriction on the gamma k which is called the Arfima condition but this is pretty like standard and pretty like flexible and then I'm not going to go in the detail and then with common difference parameter d from 0 to 1 half so you can just like a Forget about this if you don't know about what is our FEMA process, but you can just think this process is stationary and invertible and has a long memory. So that is good. So that is the first condition. So the first condition is about gamma k has a long memory. And then we assume that the output y belongs either A or B. Then we prove that our solution exists and the L1 difference converge to zero as n goes to infinity. And the since the like space issue, I didn't include the exact asymptotic rate, but the original theorem includes the exact convergence length. So under this minimal assumption, we prove the convergence. And what is the set of output A and B? A is Y, K, where the, the norm of the Y, K decay in a polynomial rate with index low, where the low is greater than 1 minus D. And second B is nothing but the L1 sequence. So that is the good thing. And I want to explain why this is a very good generalization, why this is a much general result than the short memory result. So the first, we show that exact asymptotic rate because the original theorem, you need to know the tail convergent. So you need to calculate one more time to get the exact asymptotic rate. However, we get the exact asymptotic rate and then under the long memory setting. So that is uh, very good. And then also we allow the case where the output diverges. And then we also don't need the condition where the solution converges, which is necessary in the Baxter classical Baxter inequality. And since we derive the exact convergence rate, we can define some called the weighted version of the Baxter's theorem. And then also we show that for some setting, it is optimal. And then since I've spent so much time, I will very, very briefly go over the proof. And then the thing I want to mention is the original Baxter's theorem the proof, the, the proof for short memory involves orthogonal polynomial, which is not related to time series. However, our, our proof is based on the prediction theory of time series, which I'm going to very briefly explain. So 
the winner, so winner of system is truncation can be written as a uh, matrix linear equation where t infinity is a topless matrix of this form and tn infinity, tn is a truncated topless matrix. So from this, our first observation is that the bound of the L1 bound of the solution is related to the entry-wise difference between the two topless matrices. So that is our first observation. And the second observation is, I want to say it is a magic trick because if to explain these two concepts also requires maybe like more, like 30 minutes more. So I'm going to skip the detail by using the dual process or complete DFT technique, which were developed it separately from uh, my colleague and I, with my advisor, we can show that the entries of the topless matrix can be expressed as a linear combination of the multi-step ahead or forward or backward multi-step finite predictor coefficient. That means you are able to get the exact expression of the inverse topless matrix Moreover, the inverse topless matrix of the in inverse infinite order topless matrix is a same linear combination with a multi-step infinite predictor coefficient. So our second observation is that the difference between two inverse matrix, we can evaluate the entry-wise difference. So that is the good thing. And then the bound is depends on the difference between the multi-step infinite and finite predictor coefficient. And then the last step is we want to bound the infinite and finite multi-step ahead predictor coefficient. And the idea is using the alternating projection. That is, the projection onto 1 to n can be represented as the alternating projection projection from infinite, negative infinity to n, and then projection from one to infinity. So you project, you alternating these two project, then projection, then you can get the finite projection. Then using this skill, what you can do is you can represent the best predictor coefficient as a series, where the series can be represented in terms of the infinite order AR coefficient. So that is a good thing. So the finite multi-step predictor coefficient has a series expansion. And then the first term of this expansion is the, some, the infinite coefficient. So recap is this. So using these three observations, what we can do is we can actually calculate their difference, entry-wise difference, and we get these two bounds, and I'm not going to go to the detail on the bound. However, what I want to show is bound on the near the boundary, we have a very huge error, error, and then in the middle, you have your error rates are very small. So using this, we are able to prove our theorem. So that is the good thing. And then maybe we have, yeah. So I'm going to explain, like I'll briefly explain like four application. Maybe I think I have chance to explain maybe two or three. So using our theorem, we can prove that the infinite order coefficient and then the finite approximation, which I explained on the very first few slides, we can obtain the exact bound of the L1 difference, and then the order is n to the power negative d. So that is the good thing, and this is the only very simple example of our theorem, and then we also get the finite, the h step, like multi-step ahead coefficient, and we also get the exact bound. And then, yeah, 
one thing I want to explain this is using as a currently we found this entry wise difference of the inverse to place metric then what we can get is we can get these two reserves and then the thing is these two reserves seems very simple and looks very straightforward however as far as I know these two reserves are new which means the norm of the matrix norm of the inverse topless matrix before what is known is we can bound the spectral norm of the topless inverse topless matrix so that is already known however what we can prove is we can also bound the one norm l1 norm and l infinity norm of the inverse topless matrix which I think it is a new result and uh, I think it is a uh, quite a simple but very neat result and using this what we can do is we can obtain the approximation of the inverse topless matrix and we show that it is a finite approximation than any other approximation of the inverse topless matrix and then yeah so summary so we show the Baxter theorem for a uh, block winner of system with long memory and the key idea key ingredient of the proof are inverse topless matrix representation and the alternative projection technique of the multi-step forward and backward predictor coefficient and as a byproduct, we derive a series expansion of the inverse of block topless matrix, which has a lot of application. And then we also obtain the columnized approximation error. And in the future, I think it is very possible to extend our theory to the function time series, which is a very hot topic in, I think, in time series analysis in recent years and then that is your observation xt is not a univariate not a, like a q variate random variable but it is a sequence of l2 valued function and then your auto covariance is nothing but the hilbert schumit operator sequence of hilbert schumit operators on l2 function then <coughs> what you think is we can use the same technique and prove the Baxter type theorem for functional time series which I think has not been proved or has not been shown anybody else so that is our future direction and then this is the exact late maybe you can show and this is the end of my talk and thank you for the attention. Okay. Thank you so much for the talk. Any comments or questions? Uh, very good talk. Uh, can you extend your result to interpolation problem? Oh, so that is a very good question. So, you know, you know that Okay. So you know that this is related to the interpolation function. Mm -hmm. And then what we show is the bound. Mm -hmm. So I think this bound would also give a asymptotic conversion rate of the what you call interpolation coefficient and the the infinite counterpart and then this we have the exact term so that means we can get the asymptotic rate of the interpolation coefficient is that what you yeah, mean? Yeah, the, yeah. There the, 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 the are not any existing new results. Um, you know, for example, 
uh, we use a uh, two-sided uh, two infinite AR process mm -hmm. yeah. to predict the tensors in the middle. Yeah, yeah. So we have a two-sided uh, AR coefficient. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I use, you know, mm -hmm. finite truncation mm -hmm. and the uh, difference between finite coefficient and infinite coefficient. Mm -hmm. Do you have, a, do you know any existing result like this? Backs in quality? I think what you have the latest Reserve, but I think this would give some kind okay, of okay. reserve. But as far as you know, I don't know anything. But this is, of course, this is for the room memory uh -huh. tensors. But as far as you know, I don't know any reserve on the, the Blazing coefficient. And the thing is, what other people, many, what many other people are doing is the inverse to place metrics. They use the what is called like uh, the decomposition, mm -hmm. and uh, this decomposition is I forget the name. Okay, so it has uh, Cholesky Cholesky decomposition yeah. and Cholesky decomposition is in terms of the interpolation coefficient, mm -hmm. but our approach is prediction coefficient. Mm -hmm. So their approach is are different, although we are doing dealing with the same. Object. However, what I want to say is prediction coefficient is much easier to deal with than interpolation mm -hmm. coefficient, I guess, mm -hmm. because it has a very good asymptotic rate. So maybe this, like, uh, this two alternative representation might be one uh, starting point to actually bound. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah. Thank you for that. Very good questions. So another question is that I, I have a result on predicting unirule and a model uh -huh. yeah. using finite AR model, long AR model. Mm -hmm. Then I can still get the convergence result. Yeah, you need root. So that means d equal to one or yeah. something like that. Yes, yeah. Yes, so yes. Uh, 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 may you need root. Mm -hmm. So that if I invert the may you need root, then it become an infinite a uh, it become an AR model, but the coefficient is not summable. Yes. Right. Yes, right. So some, uh, something like your case, but uh, you are focusing on a long memory process. Yes. Right, but uh, uh, we 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 can consider even a uh, uh, <laughs> difficult situation where the uh, coefficient goes like uh, j minus one and mm. sum of j minus one. Mm. Right, so so yeah. it, it, the the sum is uh, is not uh, finite. So I was wondering if your result can be extended to that kind of uh, problem. Uh, I mean, you need to uh, make it simple. So, uh, I mean, so if you are, if you just like, aside from the like, theoretical, like, well definedness of like, and that, or other, like, uh, theoretical things, but then maybe like a this alternating projection maybe works maybe works for the unit root case but of course it you cannot prove like a this kind of thing for like special case like a unit root case so maybe need to use a different tools but I don't have much tools on the like oh, you need to it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just ask it. Yeah. Yeah. So the question about the what Neumann alternative mm -hmm. provision is so here you have the limit as n goes to infinity, is it the same n as the n on the left hand Oh side? no, it's different n. Oh is is uh oh actually yeah so this and first and the third are two different 
So this, this end is already. So which end is going to infinity on the right hand side? On the oh oh really? Oh so oh, sorry. This is k and k go to infinity. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. That's why you say. Maybe one more question is mm -hmm. um, is the assumption of stationary uh, crucial here? Do you, do you think there be some extension if you allow some locally stationary? Oh, okay, <coughs> okay. Then the so the thing is local stationary <coughs> prediction might be. Uh, I mean, like as far as I know, like a prediction does not make sense. I guess because you know, like a prediction only depends on the end point. So and then you can go beyond, but if it's stationary, the whole data is support your prediction. But local stationary only ends few data support. So prediction does not make sense, which means this like a this is not a quite a good approach. However, maybe if you use some kind of interpolation kind of argument, maybe, so that's my thinking is, you can just like uh, use this and then convert to the interpolation problem, then maybe you can do something meaningful. But in terms of the prediction, maybe local stationary setting is not very suitable object. <laughs> Any other questions? Not that less thanks if you get <laughs>